There we go. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I asked you on the way here, um, the last time you saw it, you said a couple of years ago. Has, how does it feel seeing it again? Quite emotional. <laughs> what, what is it about it, do you think? that does, Do all the memories come back to you? Yes. I absolutely adored making it. Huh. As a matter of fact, I'm the one who asked the producer to make that into a film. You asked Arthur Freed? Yes. What were the circumstances of, of well, that? Arthur Freed came to see me on the stage while I was making a film where I was playing an orphan, Lily, and I was very with very drab clothes and no makeup and so on, and a sad little character. And he asked me, listen, all this is not my kind of film. I don't like to see you like this. I would like to make another film with you. We had made An American in Paris together. And he said, I want to bring back the glamour <laughs> <laughs> in your life. So have you any ideas? And I thought of one or two ideas, and mm, he said, mm. and then I came up with Gigi. I was absolutely crazy about Colette's writing. I had read practically, I have the whole collection now, but I had read quite a lot of her books. And I came up with Gigi, the idea, be which uh, I didn't look very far for it because Audrey Hepburn was playing it on Broadway. And I thought, my God, isn't she lucky that such a great character, such a great novel. So I did mention to Arthur, what about Gigi? And he said, hmm, I'll get back to you on that. And it took him about two years because Colette had so many husbands, lovers. <laughs> She'd given the, the rights to different people, editors and so on. And so it took him quite a long time to get the rights. And um, During which I had a second baby. <laughs> because what people don't know is that when I played the little girl, I already had a baby. I was already a mother. So you were 26 in... in I was 26, yes. Yeah. And playing that scene in the beginning of the film made me so exhausted. <laughs> 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 I remember having to stay in bed the next day. I was exhausted. I nearly caught the flu. I, you know... At 26, you don't feel like running around like a little girl. <laughs> and that, that uh, if I remember correctly from what you said, that, that opening sequence was the first thing... We did, yes. Yes. So that's, you were, unsurprisingly, that whole sequence on the Bois de Boulogne uh, was filmed first. Yes. So you, were, you had to be at the end of the film, walking in your pink dress with Louis Jordan married, uh, on the Bois de Boulogne. And you also had to be Gigi yes. as a little girl on the Bois yes. de Boulogne. Yes. And I think we must have done it uh, rather close together. I think we were in Paris to do Gigi, to do the exteriors for uh, one month, the month of August, when it was possible to have carriages in the streets and empty streets and get rid of television antennas and <laughs> everything. All the cars, I remember it was very difficult. The police had to help a lot to hold the real traffic. The real traffic 19, What was it, 58? Yeah, well, I suppose it was released in 58. It would have been filmed in yeah. 57, 58. 57. Yeah. And um, the, all the exteriors were filmed in, in Paris. 
And there's a wonderful shot of you going up to see Aunt Alicia and exterior. Yes. And I gather there's very little, um, there was very little light. We had a window of something like less than a minute. And Joe Rottenberg, the cameraman, was watching the clouds in his eye, in his uh, little glass. And he said, he would say to us, Okay, now, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, get ready, shoot, film, you know, and we had just some less than a minute to do that. And your hat fell off. And, he and kept my hat was held by the pin. I looked up for something to do, <laughs> looked up at uh, Aunt Alicia's window, and my hat fell back on the pin. And I thought, oh, hell, I've ruined the pin. <laughs> and I looked for the hat and looked for the hat. And of course, it was still there. <laughs> so I was really furious and plonked it on my head. And they kept it in. They kept it in. You thought you'd ruined the only yes, shots you could I get. I thought the only one, it was very, very rainy that summer. Uh, unusual Paris weather in August. And, uh, yeah. You, you, can, you can't see it in the film. It looks absolutely glorious throughout. Well, you don't see all that much outside, do we? I suppose that you see the sequences where Louis Jordan is singing Gigi and yes. those look all lovely. And um, But the, you also filmed at the Ice Palace and which it. existed then. It doesn't exist anymore. It was a real... It yes, was a real... It's a real ice rink, yeah. Do you, do you remember when they uh, got rid of it? Was, was it... They just... I think around the 80s. What a shame. It yeah, looks it is a shame. I think it's become a theatre. Oh, oh, well. Yeah, yeah. W w w w give and take. Oh, That's yes, right. they didn't destroy the house. It's It's... You know, it's glorious. What are your memories of uh, Vincent Minnelli? I, I, I hear he, he wasn't terribly he helpful to actors, even though he was an artist. He was a genius. He, it didn't matter. No, he was incapable of giving you any advice, any help. But he had this passion for his work, for his film. He was a painter to begin with. So to him, the beauty of Paris 1900, with those beautiful costumes by Cecil Beaton. And Cecil Beaton also had chosen all the furniture in all the houses, all the decors. It just was a joy to look at. So uh, Vincent, enjoyed all that, but he was incapable of finishing a sentence. He would <laughs> sort of, the lips would move, no sound would come out, <laughs> sort of, uh, 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 do it again. <laughs> do it again, angel. And uh, I, in um, I Don't Understand, the, the Parisians, there's a, you tell a story in your autobiography about um, he was constantly doing it again. You couldn't understand oh. why the end of it. Yes, we had to redo the end of, of the Parisians. And yes, take five, take 10, take 15. I was quite desperate. I thought, what am I? There must be a piece of me there because I was filming there. They cut it out. Ah. Yeah. There is a, f a bit of film in front of the swans. I, uh, but it is there. Oh, is it? It is there. You saw it? Oh, yes. Okay. I didn't, I blink, I, I didn't miss I it. I see Louis in front of the swans, and I was looking at the swans, thinking, what are they doing? Moving in unison, <laughs> right and left. And right and left, I thought, my goodness, did, did Vincent train them? <laughs> <laughs> how, did they, how did he manage that? And at the end of my take, 
He said, great, print, wonderful. The swans were perfect. <laughs> and that's what he was waiting for. All that time. Yes, never mind us. <laughs> and how about your, um, your co-stars? Did you, you, it sounds like it was a very happy company. It certainly was. It certainly was, but Louis was never satisfied with his work. He, I suppose there was a thwarted director in him. Oh. And he used to say, oh, we should have done this, that, the other. And I would say, Louis, why don't you tell Vincent if you don't like the staging? But it, I think he's enchanting and his voice is so lovely. Yes, I mean, on the subject of voice, you had a rather, um, well, a, b a bitter experience, did, did you not? Because you were... I was dubbed. You were dubbed. It must yes, have been really except irritating. the beginning of uh, the jewel scene. That's my own voice. And later, I think if you buy the record now, my voice is printed. Uh, on the uh, DVD, they, yes. they've, they've restored you. Yes, but somehow, in those days, MGM wanted everything to be so perfect. Do you know there isn't one sound that's original? Original. Everything is dubbed afterwards. Every sigh, every everything is dubbed. Yes, I, I, I was aware of it in some of um, Hermione Gingold's um, oh, really? uh, t stuff, yes. I mean, you've seen it a, a lot a lot of times. You, you can see that it was mainly probably because of picking her up on the, on the set or, or somebody up on the set um, just to get it clearer, they might. Uh well, we did it later, like three months later. Every word is totally dubbed. That's the way MGM worked. And I think they were going to, what I've read is that they were going to release one of your songs before the film came out, and they decided they, that the, it needed to be sung in a, I don't know, a 1950s acceptable yeah. way. Well, they wanted a real singer, and I was making, first of all, I'm not a singer, I certainly wasn't, I didn't have a trained voice, and I wanted to sing like a little girl would. Yeah, that's the whole point, isn't it? Yeah. So with a sort of straightforward childish voice. And uh, so, yeah, Arthur Freed didn't tell me anything. I came in Hollywood, I took the flight for retakes, and in the street of MGM, uh, someone, a friend, told me that, uh, do you know you've been dubbed? <laughs> what? <laughs> because I had recorded all the songs myself. So I marched, you know, <laughs> like I'm capable of doing. <laughs> <laughs> I marched up to the producer's uh, office and I got there. I sat down, he could see that I was in a temper, and he said, hold on a minute. He got up from behind his desk and left the room. And I sat there and waited and waited and waited. And finally I got up and went to his secretary's office and said, where's Arthur gone? And he said, she said, oh, didn't you know, he left 10 minutes ago. Rather than, rather than make his apologies to he you. He didn't want to face me. <laughs> you were too scary, Leslie. That's, that's what it is. And, anyway. And, um, you don't have much to do with Maurice Chevalier. Your character doesn't. Um, Honoré and Gigi don't have much to do with each other in the film, but did you get to know him at all? Yes. I had a great admiration for his... Uh, professionalism. He was remarkable. I made another film with him where I played his wife, Fanny. Fanny, yes, Joshua Logan. Yeah. yeah. And I got to know him better there. 
there was an exchange of photographs, <gasps> signed photographs, uh. which is something that used to be done in his time. Uh. Yeah. And I really, I mean, you can tell when you're working with an actor who passionately adores his, his job. And he was like that. I, I, he won an honorary, or he was given he, an honorary Oscar for his... For uh, this performance. And, well, and for his, I think, overall career as career, well. Yes. Among the, the nine Oscars that this film yeah. won. It was a record, I, I think. In those days, it was certainly a, rec a, rec a record because uh, no, uh, no uh, musicals ever won Oscars. It was always for the romantic films where the lady dies in the end, <laughs> <laughs> either killed or... Yeah. But uh, so that, that really was really very much about. Mind you, an American in Paris had won the Oscar for Best Film. Yes, yeah. it seems you're the magic touch, I think, yeah. <laughs> as the, in all of these things. I was very lucky. And um, the highlights of the film, what, uh, certainly one of them for me, are your lesson scenes with Isabel Jeans, yes. who I, I think is just terrific. In a, it's quite a big performance for a, for a movie, isn't it? It's it's quite sort of Edith Evans uh, proper. Yes, she was a remarkable performer, remarkably professional. She never got out of her corset at lunch. <laughs> we would all unlace and you know sit about and relax. And not she. She remained very prim and proper, remain in character throughout. Well, she was a great star on the British stage, yeah. wasn't she? Noel Coward's star, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, and, um, but th this was the, the crown of her film career, I, I think she... I'm not surprised, yeah. yes. Well, she was delightful, but she got very upset to see me. You see, she was cheating. She didn't have a real ortholon to crunch. <laughs> there were no bones in her bird. <laughs> it was made of pastry. <gasps> Scandal. <laughs> you know, of course she could eat like this, elegantly. I had to crunch the, the, <laughs> the bones, I must say. So she got quite upset seeing me eat those bones, having to swallow the bones. So she c kept forgetting her lines, and I had to do it again and <laughs> again. <laughs> and after the scene, <laughs> Vincent said, well, let's move on, Let next scene. And I said, excuse me a minute, I'm going to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and I got rid of the birds. <laughs> what do they taste like? Have you... They sort of... They were overcooked, oh. if you ask me. <laughs> is it sort of chickeny or something, is it? I don't know, but it, it just was... Uh, Horrible. Yes, I remember the bones sticking <laughs> out <laughs> my cheeks. And um, did you have any... Um, did you meet Eva Gabor at all? You're, you're not in Yes, the yes, yes. I had worked with her sister, uh, Jaja, who was a big number in Hollywood. <laughs> she was always in the press, a new diamond, a new <laughs> mink coat. Every year she kept changing. And she would give me advice, darling, take your diamond to the jeweler and ask him to exchange it for another one. Because people must think that Every new gentleman who takes you out gives you a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she was adorable, actually, very generous. They both were lovely ladies. Oh, that, that's nice. To Eva know. was more of a stage actress, right? Yeah, which Eva never did. 
Yeah, it, she's she's she very good. Her. Yeah, Ava's good, I think, in her, her little. Yes, she's very good. Very enjoyable. And um, how do you feel about having been part of Gigi when it was released? Did you you were you were Hello Gigi? Were you not? You were everybody would. Uh, well, I couldn't find a job afterwards. Really? I was playing little girls and. That's what Hollywood saw me as. You know, how to play a vamp after you've played a little girl like this. <gasps> so it was a good couple of years, at least, before anything was offered to me. I see. So that would explain the two-year gap before you were married to Maurice Chevalier in Fanny. In Fanny. Yes. Yes, which is, is a mature role for you. Was that... Yes, I really enjoyed Fanny. Well, there was something about my personality which wasn't very Hollywood. So, you know, femme fatale, I couldn't play that. I, I didn't play that, so I had to wait for the right thing. But And by th this time, as you say, you, you had to... You'd had to. You'd had Christopher, and you were pregnant with. I was pregnant with Je my daughter with during the film. <laughs> yeah, and so um, you you had married Peter Hall, and you were you set up home here. Here in London, yes. Yes, and and had and went to all those uh, left wing plays and so on, which were fascinating. I really loved all the theatre that he was doing. And you, you became the um, the first lady of Stratford upon Avon th thereafter. Yes, I I was head of the table when there was a party, <laughs> <laughs> and didn't know how to choose the wine. <gasps> <laughs> and you Actually, French as well, isn't it? Yes. So well, I didn't drink wine. I didn't. I remember Benjamin Brisson one coming for lunch, and we were serving fish. I had to be the lady of the house. And as a matter of fact, uh, Peter wasn't much better than I was <laughs> at choosing the menu and the wines. Anyway, I chose a wine at the theater that I'd heard of. And uh, when... Benjamin Britten lifted his glass. He said, that's a sweet wine. <laughs> Scandal. <laughs> yes. I, I was so embarrassed. To this day, I feel uh, guilty. It's, a, it's OK. We won't tell anybody. And, um, but uh, there's Shishi putting it away like nobody's. Well, you know what it is in the cinema. You, it's, it's some kind of uh, juice. Yes. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear they did But didn't there's one thing that I taught everyone on the set is the cigar thing. Nobody knew about cigars, but I'd seen my grandfather do that. So I taught Vincent. I said, this is the way <laughs> it should be done. And so, so you taught Isabel Jeans and Isabel Jeans taught you. Yes. Very good. That's good. I, I, I think the time has probably come to open up. Um, I hope you've got some questions about Gigi or for Leslie to talk about. Uh, does anybody, would anybody like to? Yes, hello. Um, we, there's, there's a microphone scooting towards you. It's just so everybody else, uh, everybody else can hear you see if you, if you speak. Um, I suppose Cecil Beaton took that photo of you. It's a question. Did Cecil Beaton take that photo? I don't recognise it, but I, yes, I would think so. I would just like to know what it was like to work with him. Was he on set all the time? All the time. Doing Seven fluffing. in the morning. Yeah. Arranging flowers in the vases. The only set decorator who ever did this. Not only were they real flowers, but he arranged new flowers every morning. In, in the vases. He was, and taking pictures, 
in between shots. He would drag you in the bushes, <laughs> snap you, you know. And he didn't like you to smile. He would say, let your face in repose. Gosh, you must have been relieved because you hated doing all yes, that smiling yes, for yes, Hollywood, did. didn't you? <laughs> Hollywood always smile, you know. <coughs> and, but Cecil Beaton wanted you in repose. In repose, yes. It was a question of the period, too. Right. And he's interesting in, on this film because although he had total artistic, uh, the, I say over the visuals, really, um, he was awarded the Oscar for only for the costumes. Well, there was a question of unions, and uh, there were people who were under contract with MGM and who wouldn't let him. He wasn't part of that union. I see. So... Still, he got his, his name from. wasn't there, no. but I think all the press and the critics knew that it was Cecil's. Ah. I remember Cecil's excitement after he had gone. There was one huge mansion with many floors, and on every floor were furniture from different periods of the world different parts of the world, different periods. He came back ecstatic <laughs> and said, oh, you have no idea what there is in that building, something staggering. So he chose all, every bit and pieces of oh, grandmama's apartment. That would, be for the, that would be the MGM furniture store, I, I suppose. Absolutely, Yeah, that yes. he was visiting. Eventually it was put up for sale. Oh, God. Um, any other any other questions? Yes, there's one there. There's and there's another one there. I've good. That's good. We'll get to you. The microphone dances along the row. I'm sorry, I'm old. That's great. I'd like to show my age here, but before you made all these extraordinary blockbusters and really was a big star, you also made one of the greatest films of the British New Wave which is all very unlikely. You made L-shaped room with Tom Bell, yes. which I still remember as one of, the, one of the best films of that period. Do you have happy memories of that film? Oh, yes. It was exhausting because I was in every, every shot of that film and dramatic scenes. I found it very, very tiring. And I remember I had to sleep in between scenes, <laughs> in between big scenes. And I would ask, uh, uh, oh, right now, I'm forgetting his name. No, the director of photography. Oh, no. Brian Forbes. No, no. Brian Forbes. The director of photography is, is who Leslie's oh. reaching for. I can't remember who it is. It wasn't Jeffrey Unsworth, was it? No. No. Anyway, I would ask him, how long will you be? setting up the lights for the scene, and he would say, how long do you need? <laughs> and I'd say, 25 minutes? He'd say, you've got them. <laughs> and I would just sleep on the floor anywhere, find a, a sofa, find something where I could lie down. And yeah. I mean, uh, um, El Shet Room is, is 1962, I think, so th it's... Uh, after this, um, it could, because Leslie had the most amazing career. She she was a, a musical star. You were a musical star. Yes. Who became an established leading dramatic actress. You're the only one to have done that, as far as I am aware. Bert Lancaster. He was never a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> he was a tumbler. He was an acrobat, that's acrobat. right. Yes. Uh, well, my real passion was drama, and I would have liked to, but I was with MGM, and MGM was mostly musicals. Yes, so it's really... They were the famous for musicals. It's really that first decade of your film career is the dancing, the dancing years, as yes. we, we might say. 
apart from the odd moment for Ken Russell a bit later. Yes. Okay. Um, sir, you had a, a question, did you not? Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you, but do feel free. What, what, what was it? Yes. Was that a move? Was it a deliberate move to move yes, into Yes, that's drama? what I really wanted to do. Remember, I was married to Peter Hall. Very, lots of drama, the new wave, and the kitchen sink. Yes, you came along at a good time in that yes. respect. You had good, it was a good move. And, and I loved the playing drama, I wanted most of all to continue with drama. But uh, there wasn't, I didn't do that much drama in my career. Uh, I made films in Poland with Zanussi and they were sort of dramatic, but... But you, you also worked with um, Truffaut? With yes. Louis Mal, yes. I mean, with René Clément, um, that's quite a lot. Of with René uh, Clément and Orson Welles, yes. I mean, you know, what a thrill! Your role in *Is Paris Burning* is a it's a very dramatic, very dramatic, distressing yes. role. Yes, I I needed to recover after that drama. It was really distressing. It was very distressing because there were still lots of survivors with the numbers tattooed. And God, it just made you sick. And you, you couldn't really ask them what their story was, but it, it, it was the real thing still. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a very, it's an interesting film. Moving film is Paris burning. Um, any other questions? Yes, yes, ma'am. There's, there's a lady on the front row. Um, this, this, I've been sitting here wondering and thinking this is probably inappropriate to ask, but I'm sitting right here. Your skin absolutely glows. <laughs> How do you do that? What's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it is a bit inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> You're beautiful. I think it may be that I'm a bit overdressed with this. I'm a bit hot. <laughs> <laughs> and a bit emotional. And very thrilled to be seeing the film again. And, you know, the first time I saw the whole film was at Cecil Beaton's house. He had managed to get a private uh, a private uh, viewing for the Duchess of and the Princess of. And so it was a very glamorous little group. And I was there, and that was the first time I saw the film. I came out of it crying. <laughs> I can't see why. <laughs> I'm pretty good. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful moment in it when you emerge in the dress. Not the first dress, the, dre the dress that you go to Maxime's yes. in. And um, it's a, such a f strange moment because there is no music. You just emerge with the, the dress. It's very powerful as, a, as an image that they chose not to... The I was thinking thing the same thing. There's very little background music nowadays, whether you're looking at a film on television or uh, whatever, or a series. It's music all the way through. So this is quite, yeah. It, 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 for a musical, it's very, very res restrained. And yes. that, maybe that's got something to do with Andre Previn, who... Uh, won his Oscar for the sc the score. The background music. The yeah, scoring. maybe he was urging tactfulness. Uh, though, because it's that's my job, Leslie, is to um, write 
music that's always in the way. So um, I, I'm holding up the flag for us there. Uh, yes, there's a question over there with that lady. There's a mic winging, but I think probably you can... It's traditional to have a microphone, isn't it? There you go. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just such a big admirer of so many of your films, especially Lily and uh, Daddy Long Legs. And I was just wondering, maybe this is an unfair question to ask, but what was perhaps your favorite film uh, that you've made? Well, Daddy Long Legs would be among them. I, I, I mean, I have more than one favorite, and Gigi is definitely one. But Daddy Long Legs, working with Fred Astaire, what a thrill. What a wonderful, wonderful partner, charming person, witty and amusing and so gentlemanly, so kind. It really was a great treat. Do, do you have um, favorites among your dr dramatic roles as well as the musical ones? Because the... the, the well, the Earth-Shaped Room yeah. was a grand departure for me, a big, big part in drama. <coughs> Um, because your, your musicals, I, I should imagine that they may all be favourites because they're all so extraordinary. An American in Paris, uh, Lily, uh, the, the Glass Slipper, which I don't think anybody sees these days, but, you know, it's a fine film. And uh, Gigi. They're all wonderful films. Yes, I really was extremely lucky. Um, maybe I did refuse the bad ones, I must say. <laughs> yeah. There were a few. Yeah, MGM was always trying to throw you in a film that didn't, you know, was put together just uh, as an in between film. Because they also, in those days, owned all the cinemas in every oh, town right. in America. So every week they had to come up with new films. So they would put together films sometimes and it were really oh. second rate. Right, I remember you referring to one of these, uh, a, a remake of Waterloo Bridge, is that not right? Oh, terrible, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gabby. I mean, Vivian Lee did a beautiful job. Why make it again? And was that was just a job because you were under contract? I couldn't walk out of it, yes must watch that again and uh, remind myself about Oh, it. please don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? Yes, there's one on the front row. I've got you on the back row, sir, as, as well. Uh, I'll get there. Oh, in fact, it's going to you first. Very good. Hi there. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Um, I just, I actually love, Gigi's one of my all-time favourite films as well. And I'd like to ask if you had a favourite scene in the film. Do you have a favourite scene in Gigi? In Gigi? Yes. I think the one where she says, Oh, you love me. <laughs> How can you say you love me? <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, it's very funny. <laughs> it is. It, it is, it is. And you do it very well. It's a good. She really means it. Yeah. The writing of the, the film is very good. It's the oh, scenes it's are very oh, well yes. put together and funny. Oh, he was a wonderful writer and a wonderful lyricist. Yeah, and he won the Oscar to Alan Jalen. There's a there's a <laughs> question down here, um, which we'll be able to hear, but possibly the audience won't. We're keeping you on your toes from the back to the front. And um, it's this gentleman here, the fourth. Hi, I think that's a really great comic performance in Gigi, and there's lots of real fun comedy. Now, I, I know you said your preference is probably for drama, but um, have you enjoyed making the comedies as well? I'm thinking of Father Goose. Was it good working with Cary Grant? And that, that looked a fun movie. Well, how lucky can you get? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you, you, you in, I think that's a, a good point. You, you do seem to enjoy the comedy. Well, 
what fun it was to work with Cary Grant, to except he was so naughty. <laughs> he would always try to break up the crew and me, mostly me. <laughs> he knew he had a good scene when I broke up and ruined the film. And at times also the crew would break up and because he had a fine sense of humor. He, and he was happy then, because he knew it Oh, he, that thrilled him. He, he didn't mind wasting the film. <laughs> Did he also not give you advice about um, not, not to leave a little gap after his laugh line? Right, yes, 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 he taught me that. <clears throat> and um, Let them laugh, wait a second, yeah. And then come in. Yeah. Oh, that's very good. He would do that, certainly. He would find a way of using that second or two. With a glance or a... Yes. Yeah, yeah he's very good. Um, are there any other? Any more? Oh, yes. I see that arm waving fiercely there. Go on, then. Would Gigi be made nowadays? Which, which, looking back on your yes. career, yeah, yeah would you, which of your films would not be made today, do you think? I did make a few duds. No, that's not the, it's about the political correctness. It's, it's about the content, really. The, the courtesan element in Gigi and the abortion element in um, L Shape Room. Uh, d do you think? Well, it would be very sad if you couldn't. Uh, say what was quite natural in those days. And I, my relationship with Gaston is quite natural, quite a little girl. There's no ambivalence there. So I don't see that there is any cause to find offense or be shocked. And if one does, it's really sad, because that is a wonderful story. It does happen. Look at uh, Emmanuel Macron. <laughs> <laughs> I have a photograph in my telephone, which I will never lose, of the husband, his wife, and the little boy. Interesting. The, the student, and he must have been about 14. And she does look uh, quite radiant and young. Very good. I'm Nobody glad. in the world questioned that relationship. It does happen. It's, it's, I'm glad you told that, uh, made that comparison in the uh, French Institute cinema. <laughs> uh, I'm glad too. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. No, I think you, liberty, you have to be able to. You wouldn't have any uh, Colette. I mean, all her literature, all her books are very free in relationships. After all, she had a long relationship with the son of her husband number two, and came out with a wonderful play out of it. What is the play called? Oh, I don't know. Good. I must read it immediately. I, I don't know it. That's good. Does anybody else, anybody know that? Uh, Colette's tale of her. Good she little. made a, she wrote she made a, play, a play out of it, which is very famous. Uh, I don't know enough of a her A woman work. in her... 40, 50s. Cherie. Cherie. Bravo. Merci. Bravo. Cherie. Cherie. Oui, Cherie. Was that made into a film? I don't know. Yes. There we go. Um, this has been a very educational evening. Uh, any, any other 
questions before we le leave? Any other secrets you would like? Yes, sir. Do since you've educated us, I'll give you another question. No, I think I, I just want to, but there are some wonderful actresses who, whose films are forever. I mean, Betty Davis, you, you will run to see any of her films. I looked at one last night. She is in, in a Agatha Christie Murder on the Nile. Yes, Death on the Nile, that's right. We saw that yeah. quite recently. No, I I am thrilled. It's it's a wonderful feeling, and I'm very proud. And I have refused some films, which quite a lot, which I thought were not worth making. And in that case, you have to to follow your judgment and say no thank you even though there may be a lot of money I think um, one of the f the ways in which the gentleman's uh, comment might be true is that um, with musicals there's something about the delight that musicals give that make them perhaps particularly memorable and they engender a kind of affection for people uh, is that true, do you think? I don't know whether it is or not. And uh, certainly this is a particular example <laughs> of that. And um, I can't thank you enough for it. Well, before you say that, I was very keen on Gigi because not only is it amusing and charming, but it is a real story for Colette. Colette knew a lot of courtesan. She's well known for having relationships with courtesans. She thought they were sometimes very uh, remarkable women who had given, in those days, there was very little choice of professions for women. And in order to raise their children, they had resorted to prostitution. And this, this story meant a lot for her. The real story of Gigi, if you read the book, is there's some unsavory details about corns on her feet and her behavior in bed and so on and so forth. In all of Colette's work, there are details which are little unsavory. Uh, but she felt compassion for those women who had given up their happiness uh, often for to raise either for somebody in her family, her mother, or her children needed food. And so that's, you know, I think there's something real about the story when Gigi says, yeah, I know what it means. It means I'm going to sleep in your bed. And yes. when you'll be tired of me, uh, you know, I mean, there's Frank. And that's the way she thought. Yes, I mean, that's the line. That exchange between yeah. Gigi and Gaston is th the kind of center of it, isn't it? And yeah. it's amazing it ever got on, given that it was 1958. Um, for all the sweetness of the film, there is that backbone. Yes, and I knew <coughs> Burgundy, where she comes from. I knew her village. I know her house by heart. And if you go over there, there is a chateau in Saint Sauveur, the village is called. And uh, there were some rich people in there. And uh, Colette's mother, Sido, when a girl in the village was pregnant and not married, 
would go up and knock on doors and ask for money to, to help this woman. She'd go up to the cast to the chateau and ask for money and was thrown out. And now <laughs> the chateau has become a museum for Colette. Wow. And on every step of the big staircase, there's the name of one of her books. So she told the truth. She told the truth about women who have to resort to prostitution. And at one point, Gigi thinks she is going to have, so to, have to do that. Yeah. And she says, okay, I'd rather be, un I'd rather be ha unhappy with you than without you. And this is all from the heart of Colette. Yeah, it's so it's remarkable, and perhaps that's what you like in this film, the Burgundian honesty of Colette, I which I caught because I knew her well. I know the village, I know her house, I know the conversations she had with her mother. And yeah, and you, you, you feel you captured? Yes, oh yes, I do. I, kn I know just how she would say, uh, I know what it means to be with you. It means sleeping in your bed. You know, she says it just like that. And, uh. and it's, it's, it's remarkable, that honesty. Well, and uh, now she's in a pantheon. She is. Yeah. Colette. Well, she's the only, or was the first woman, to be buried in the French in the pantheon in, the pantheon. in Paris. Well, um, you are in a, a pantheon of a different kind, <laughs> and um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, Leslie Carroll. <laughs>